being can attract will cause somebody to either speak about bad about their brother, not knowing the facts about certain things, not being submissive, not being a person willing to be taught. So when you have somebody that doesn't act or live accordingly to these principles, you're going to have a rebellious person. And this is who Cain was. Cain was not happy that uh, that God had shown favor on Abel. Cain did not want to change. He did not want to hear or at least do what he was supposed to do. So what he did, instead of trying to change, he said, in order for me to get this position, in order to, for me to be accepted, I just take down my brother. And this is what's happening in this world, brothers and sisters. You got people out there that are out to destroy a brother. They're out to defame him. They have no respect, no loyalty, and no love. And this is what the Bible calls the sons of devils. Last week, we took some time into looking into the parable of the wheat and the tares, and we see how there's two different types of people. And here we see an example of this. A couple of verses before, John tells us that he that committed sin is of the devil. And now this statement is being said about Cain, except he doesn't say devil. He says the wicked one. He says, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew him, because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. And this is something important for us to understand. Cain wasn't evil because of what he did. Cain did what he did because he was evil. In fact, Jesus tells us this. He tells us that a good tree cannot give evil fruit, cannot give bad fruit, and an evil tree cannot give good fruit. So it's not about, it's not the fruit that it's to be blamed. That's not where the problem lays. The problem lays in what type of tree you are, and that fruit I just gives identification to that tree. And here John tells us that this person, Cain, was of the evil, was of the devil. These are very tough words, but this is inspired by the Holy Spirit. This is the the, the words of the Holy Spirit through the Apostle John. And he says he murdered him because he was evil, because of his evil works, and his brother was righteous. And this is something that's so important that we see through all the scriptures, brothers and sisters, is that always the evil one persecutes the righteous from the beginning. That's the way it works. Why? Because those that do righteousness give light to the evil works of those who practice them. If you're in a place, in a workplace, where your coworkers tend to curse or tend to, you know, say um, dirty jokes and and they come around you and you react in a different way than the world does and you react in a way that shows that you are disgusted by those things, they will take notice of that. And some would either respect you and will honor your position, but then there will be others that will dislike you for it. They will... Take it into their hearts like if you're telling them that you're superior to them. And it's not about that. We are not superior to anyone, but rather the one who is great is inside of us. We're not better than them. It's just that we have the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit convicts us. If we didn't have the Holy Spirit, we would not have the power to be able to do it. And that's something that's so important. The fact that we live in a certain way, the fact that we um, follow God, It's not a reason for us to be prideful about. It's not a reason for us to think ourselves to be better than others. But the fact that we do not partake in the things that others partake, people will either respect us for that or they will resent us and hate us for it. And that's exactly what we see in the scriptures. It's always the evil one that persecutes the good. We see it in the story here of Cain and Abel. Cain slew his brother Abel. Because his offering was not accepted, and Abel's was. So instead of trying to do right, instead of looking at himself and say, hey, I'm the problem, he decided to kill his brother so that 
there wouldn't be anything around to show him how evil he was. And that's something that we, happens when we look at the Word of God. We look at the righteousness of God, and then that, that causes us to see the flaws that are in us, just like when we look into a mirror. And that's what happens when a wicked person comes in contact with a righteous person, a person made righteous by Jesus Christ, not because of, of some kind of moral superiority. We see that in Ishmael and Isaac. We see in Esau and Jacob, where Esau wants to kill Jacob. And we see many places in the scriptures where there's tense encounters because of that. We see that in the life of Saul and David, that Saul hated David because God's favor was upon him. He wanted to kill him. He persecuted him. He chased him around into caves and, and all over desert places because of his hatred for the man who God had chosen to replace him. We see that in the Old Testament prophets, that they were persecuted by those that were evil because they were proclaiming the truth of God, by those that were rebellious to God's word. We saw that in the religious establishment, how they falsely accused Jesus and led him to be crucified. And if they did so to Jesus, then they would also do that to us. After Jesus was crucified, after his resurrection and ascension, then they also persecuted the church. The leaders of the religious movements persecuted the Christians. And in fact, this is not just something that we see in practice in these stories, in these narratives, but Paul himself tells us in Galatians chapter 4, verse 28 and 29. He says, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was are the children of promise. But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted, that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. This is a constant, constant war that the evil want to do against the righteous. And, that, and we see the culmination of that in the book of Revelation where Satan, the great dragon, tries to destroy and annihilate all those that will refuse to, to show allegiance to him, that will refuse to stand with him. Those that will stand for God and for what is right and for what is true, he will try to annihilate them completely. But they will not succeed. They will not succeed because though they may destroy the body, they cannot destroy the soul. And the more they try to destroy us, the more victorious we are because we have God on our side. God is with us, and if God is with us, who can be against us? That's why Jesus says the gates of hell should not prevail against his church. Brother and sister, we are victorious. Amen. Let's take a look at a couple of scriptures here, and then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to continue that verse that we were just reading. But I want to look for an example of what is it talking about here when it talks about for an example, Cain, what, what, what are these people like that do these things? And I want to go to the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 11. Okay, this is something that Jesus is saying, not something that, you know, anybody else said, but Jesus said. He says, blessed are you when people insult you. So one of the first things that you're going to get, right, when you're a person that's talking righteousness and are somebody that, uh, you know, that are doing God's will, you're going to get insulted. Jesus got insulted. Paul got insulted. All the apostles did. Everybody that preaches the gospel gets insulted. This is something that's going to be common to somebody that's doing God's will. Second thing that's going to happen, and that's something that Brother Javer just touched. He said, persecution. He says, you will be persecuted. So all of us that preach the gospel at one time or another are going to be persecuted a lot, some more than and others. Some are put in prison, some are killed around the world. So this is something normal, brothers and sisters. You know, uh, the devil doesn't like the truth. And when you declare the truth, he's going to do everything to cause conflict and problems. So this is something that doesn't faze me one way or another. I'm used to this type of stuff because, you know, this is the type of stuff that the world wants to hear. You know, he, they want to hear false things. They want to believe false things. And when you tell and when you say the truth, 
you're going to have people that are going to rebel against you. You know, so this is something that we could see. It happened to Jesus. It happened to the apostles. They were persecuted for. They were nailed to the cross. They were burned. They were killed. You know, and this is happening now. There's children that their heads are getting being cut off. Their family members, the same thing, for saying the truth. And another thing it says here, you it will happen to us too. Blessed are you when people insult you, right? persecute you and falsely say all kind of evil against you because of me. So in other words, the other thing, you're going to be accused falsely. They're going to bring false accusations against them. And this is something that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the people of the world, right, at those Roman officials that went and wanted Jesus Christ crucified on the cross, they accused him falsely for something he never did. He never committed any sins. He never tried to hurt anybody. He tried to teach the truth. And yet the people of the world rebelled against the truth. The the people of the world put them up on a cross. The people in the world whipped them. You know, why? Okay, let's go now to the scriptures and see why this happened here. And it says, uh, verse 13, Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that the world hates you. So it shouldn't be something that will alarm me or any other preacher of the gospel. If you're getting hate, it's because the devil doesn't like what you're saying. Right? And then it says, we know that we have passed from death to life. We know we have eternal life. The world doesn't know that. And that's why the world hates us. They are envious of what we got. And Cain was envious of his brother Abel, of the attention that he was getting from God, of the acknowledgement he was getting from God. And that's why he rebelled. And that's why you're going to get what you get in this world if you preach the truth. Now watch this. Because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. So listen, folks, the whole thing here boils down to one thing. We need to love our brothers. We need to respect our brothers. And we need to apply this scripture to us. Matthew twenty two thirty seven. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. If you love the Lord your God with all your mind and with all your soul and with all your heart, You will love your brother. You will do what the Father's will is. I want to go back to verse 14, because John tells us something that's extremely important. He says in verse 14, he says, We know that we have passed from death to life. What what is he speaking about here when he says, We know we've passed from death to life? He's talking about being born again. He's talking about being saved and transformed. This is something that is deep and is very serious to look at, Especially in a day and age where there's a lot of confusion as to what salvation is and how do we know that we're saved. And here John tells us, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. One of the signs that show that a person has been born again, that we can use to examine ourselves, is if we love other Christians. Do we love the brethren? Do we love the church? You know, there's people that call themselves Christians, but they look down on other Christians that perhaps are not as fervent as they are. Perhaps they don't have the convictions that they do. And they look down on others. Like if... They're superior to them. And how dare you do that? When Jesus Christ paid for their sin as much as he paid for ours, how dare you look down on another brother and sister because they're not as strong as you are and call them a cultural Christian or call them anything else other than a brother? I understand there's Christians that are wrong, I understand there's Christians that perhaps don't give the importance that they should to the spiritual life. And I'm not talking about people that are out living in sin. We already looked at that last week. A Christian who could continue to live in sin is not a Christian. Because clearly the scripture tells us that 
a, a person who commits sin and who 